A lot of people might just envy Fran Lebowitz. For decades, she has made a living by saying exactly what's on her mind in a style that's all her own. Fran Lebowitz hit the spotlight in the 70s when Andy Warhol made her a columnist for his magazine, Interview. Her first two collections of essays put her on the cultural map, but a serious case of writer's block turned Lebowitz into a talker. There's always something to complain about making her famous for her opinions. What's your idea of people who run around trying to get exercise? I really don't think that the average law-abiding citizen should be confronted by a herd of overweight adults wearing lime green suits. She made a career of offering up controversial social commentary. One of the differences between children and adults is that when children don't get something, they ask. When adults don't get something, they become Republicans. There's nothing about him. These days, Leibowitz is just as acidic when it comes to President Trump. Sometimes I sit on the subway, I think to myself when the doors open, whoever comes in the store first is gonna be better, would be a better president than Donald Trump. Or the Me Too movement. Do I think that, you know, men are, would prefer this wasn't happening? Yes, I do. I met up with her in the only place on earth she says she would ever live, New York City, ahead of her sold out talks in Toronto this weekend to talk about the state of, well, just about anything. I guess my first question is is the most basic one. You know, how, how are you? What, what's rattling around in your head today? Uh, you know, this is, I'm sure everyone says this to you. Um, all we think about is Donald Trump. Why does it preoccupy you so Because it's, so, it's horrible. Like, it's less horrible for you, but if you're an American, you know, you can't, you just, you can't believe it. You know, I mean, you just can't believe it. And it's not like I didn't live through other terrible presidents. Um, it's totally preoccupying, and it changes second by second. Well, it does. I mean, we're, we're in a moment now where, the, where one of the conversations is just maybe North and South Korea will decide to call the whole thing off and, and make nice, and he'll be on his way to collect a Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, this is not something I believe, by the way. <laughs> All right? I, I don't believe any of this, you know? I mean, um, I, no one is easier to play than Donald Trump. No one. There are newborn babies who are more savvy than Donald Trump. I mean, I, I don't believe it, let me put it that way. I, I hear you, what you're saying about him being played, but yet he's in the White House, and, I, and I, I've heard you talk before about not seeing that coming. Is that, is that true? Oh, 100%. <laughs> and believe me, I mean, I, I always felt before the election that um, in a profound way, my profession was being right all the time. I believe myself to be right all the time. And people have always said to me, you're the only person I know who in the middle of an argument just goes, you're wrong. You know, because I've always felt this tremendous confidence in how right I am. Yet, I spent the entire year before the election going all around the country telling thousands of people, don't worry, there's zero chance he could win. And I absolutely, of course, I believe that. Zero chance. So how do you rationalize that? As you say, I mean, you, you spent a career being right, and you were wrong. Now I'm wrong, really wrong. Um, here's the thing. It's not that I didn't know. Well, first of all, the one thing everyone seems to disregard, um, you know, there is Russia to contend with here, which I certainly didn't know about, all right? Um, and, you know, that, I mean, I'm, I don't know if we're ever going to find out exactly, you know, right. but it certainly had a real effect on the election. So I didn't know about that. Um, I knew there were a lot of stupid people in the country. I've lived here my whole life. You know, um, I didn't realize there were that many. Um, I also, you know, I watched the, those um, campaign, whatever he calls them, those uh, rallies, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, why is there all that emotion at those rallies? And that emotion is apparently the sheer happiness in being able to express your bigotry, which you've had it kind of kept, you know, keep undercover the last, you know, 40 years in this country. So am, am, is this a bit of a preview of, of what it would be like in Toronto? Because I'm so curious <laughs> for, for you to go there. I mean, it was scheduled for one night, sold out. So now there's another night. What do you think they want from you? Truthfully, no matter where I go, even Australia, you know, since Trump, it's like 90% it's like what people want to talk about. Do you have any thoughts for Prime Minister Trudeau? For uh, or about him? Well, um... I remember his mother around town quite a bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> because she was around New York all the time, you know, in her younger days. She was at 354, you know, she was, I believe she's older than me, but 
not enough older for me not to remember her being around. Um, you know, there is not a leader in the West who, we would, who I would rather have. So ask me, would I rather have Justin Trudeau president? Yes. I'd rather have Margaret Trudeau president, <laughs> you know, even the old Margaret Trudeau. Um, so, you know, Why is that? Because we have Donald Trump. Well, I mean, it can't just be anyone other than Donald Trump. It, yes, it could be, practically. I mean, it, it practically could be. This past Friday, American high school students protested against gun violence. It was the 19th anniversary of the Columbine school shooting and comes in the shadow of Parkland, too. Fran Lebowitz seems to commend the attempt at change, but there's doubt there. When you talk about young people, we're in a, we're in a moment, though, where young people are grabbing hold of the agenda. You think about those kids from Florida, from that school. I, I think it's great, but first of all, those kids from Florida, you know, I, I, it's my fondest desire that this succeeds. It will not. Why not? Because we have gun nuts in this country that are... It, it's so shocking, their love of the gun. It isn't what they say it is, you know, the, the Second Amendment. You know, they love these guns. But isn't it possible that this is generation change, that, that these kids have decided, you know, the usual route to X may be all the way like this, but no, we're going this way. And do what? And do what? I mean, the ones that are old enough to vote, they can vote. Florida has some of the worst gun laws in the country. The, uh, worse than Texas, okay? So <clears throat> they live in a state where the majority of adults who voted voted for people who want these laws. So what would you say to these kids? I would say it's great what they're doing and I hope they succeed, okay? But if you're asking me if I think they're going to succeed, um, not this group. Uh, I know or I suspect it doesn't much matter to you how people compare you or characterize you because you, you're your own woman. But I, it is interesting to me, you know, Wikipedia made reference to you as sort of a modern Dorothy Parker. My mom says, no, no, that's not true. Fran Leibowitz is a, is a thinker who talks. And I'm wondering which one is, is closer? Well, both flatter me. Um, I'm certain Dorothy Parker also thought, you know, um, I mean, she lived in a different world, obviously. Um, there are very few women to compare women to, you know, and especially when I was young, there are more now. Um, some people are now compared to me. So um, comparisons are not very often that accurate. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to be compared to Dorothy Barker. Hard to talk with women and not talk about what it's been like to be a woman, to battle on before the Me Too movement, to be publicly, persistently objectified and worse. So we pulled a clip of Leibowitz on CBC back in 1978, where a chat about her success became a tease about men and babies. You know, I'm all ready to fill my leisure hours if I had them. What happens if you fall in love and settle down and find something you want to do, like having children or stuff? I, terribly unlikely. I'm not considering that as a possibility. Ah, but is it likely to happen to her, Mr. Mister? Of course, maybe later this evening. <laughs> <laughs> So you're a good sport. You had a good laugh at that. But I look at this from, through a lens of 2018 now, and I just, I just cringe. Uh, think, this was the world, in my opinion, until like two and a half months ago. I mean, this has been the last like a year or so of total shocks. I was as shocked by what's happened, like with this Me Too movement, as I was by the Trump election, because it never occurred to me it would change. It never occurred to me it would change because, truthfully. For, I mean, there's been some changes, but basically the way, you know, the world was for women was the same since, you know, Eve until two months ago. And then in two seconds, it changed. Is this going to make a difference? Is the Me Too movement actually going to make a difference? Absolutely. It's already made a difference. If you're asking me, is it going to make things equal, really? No. I'm curious. I sort of watch what's happening in, in the media, in film, and publishing, and sports. But what about the women who are working in insurance companies in, in small towns or working for construction companies? Yeah, the Did problem is, here's the thing. The men that got caught in New York, like Harvey and Charlie Rose and people like that, these are men who were very powerful. They didn't just have power over women. They have power over other men, okay? But most men in the world have no power 
you know, other than the power they have over women. That is all the power they have. By, by women, I mean their own wife, their own girlfriend. These are the women that people should pay attention to. You know, these are the women who really are in peril all the time. Do you think that we are also maybe in an era of a backslide in human rights? I'm talking gay rights and abortion rights, too. I mean... That is much more important, in my opinion, by the way, because abortion rights really are women's rights. I, I don't know what <laughs> is living in the pipes behind us here, but it's Steam. trying to get out, whatever it is. S Steam. Um, I, I guess my last question is, is I, I don't... Um, is that really steam, or steam. is there like this an is animal when, in there? No, no, this is steam, and this is... If you have an apartment that is this kind of heat, you can't wait to hear this, because it means the heat's coming on. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, this is a lovely sound. You're a good sport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so there is nothing gray about Fran Leibowitz's world, uh, obviously, Ian. It is black or white. Her opinions are as firm as they were in the 70s, and she is not bent. I'm sure some viewers are thinking of her as fearlessly confident, others <laughs> may be smug, but, I mean, is she still making predictions? Because she admitted that she's been wrong over the last few months on, a, on some big things. Uh, a couple things, for sure. I, absolutely, I said to her, okay, Donald Trump, one term, two term. I'm hearing so many people say they feel two term, and she said, no, no, no. Uh, she doesn't believe he will even last this term. Hmm. So again, she's that's her line in the sand. She's not afraid of making it. And was that just steam? <laughs> it was just steam. <laughs> All right.